The United States is running out of water. Well, not the whole United States. With the Great Lakes being the largest sitting supply of fresh water on Earth, it's safe to say that the states bordering it will probably have enough water to last them a while. But not everywhere else in the country can say the same. Western states like California, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and even stretching as far as Texas have strained water supplies. But let's zero in on California, because their problem is especially dire. Nearly all of California has been experiencing an extreme drought since March of 2020, but they have been having issues with water for a very long time, seeing multi-year droughts in 1976, 1987, 2007, 2012, as well as the one they're in now. Some are even calling the current drought the worst in 1,200 years. In response, the state's government called on its citizens to voluntarily limit water usage. In Los Angeles, they are asking residents to limit outdoor watering to 8-minute periods twice per week, while also saying that that could turn into an all-out ban on outdoor watering in September. Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, has called on Californians to reduce consumption by a minimum of 15%, but stating that they should realistically be shooting for 30%. While these calls for limiting water usage are, in theory, a good thing, after all, if everyone can work together limiting unnecessary uses for water, reduction can be achieved with minimal sacrifice. But the data is worrying. From March of 2020 to March of 2022, urban water usage had actually increased by 19%. The urgency of the matter just isn't getting through to all Californians. But I think it would be cruel to point fingers just at the people who are trying to get enough water to live a comfortable life. The businesses and industries operating in California should be shouldering more of the blame because, while the government has asked businesses to voluntarily make some changes, like not watering ornamental gardens and not serving water in restaurants unless specifically asked for, these ignore some of the biggest uses of water in the state like agriculture growing crops that specifically require large amounts of water. Things like almonds, alfalfa, and avocados. It's understandable that the government would want to make changes without hurting the economy of the state, but putting the blame and the responsibility solely on the residents seems a little unfair when you consider that the state has around 1,000 golf courses, 84 of which are in a 20-mile radius around Los Angeles, one of the hardest-hit cities from the drought. It seems as though they can only cut water usage by so much. Which is why this episode is going to be looking at the flip side of things. If there isn't enough water to pull from inland, or more accurately put, from the northern one-third of the state, why don't we use the water right next to California's coast? That is to say, should California use desalination to supplement their water supply? Well, grab a glass of seawater and settle in as we learn something new. Explained at its most basic level, desalination is the process of removing salt from water. But in this episode, we will be referring to it as the process of making seawater into potable water, or water that you can drink. This is an important distinction to make as we understand that simply removing the salt from seawater isn't enough. It also must be treated to be safe for consumption, driving up the cost of production. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In my last video about nuclear-powered vehicles, I talked about how desalination worked in nuclear submarines. While it was able to show that water from the ocean could be used to supply those on board, it was another question of being able to scale it from a few hundred crew members to cities with millions of people. There is in fact precedent for large-scale desalination. Persian Gulf countries such as Qatar have precious little drinking water and they have invested in the costly technology needed to filter the salt out of their salt water and pass the cleaned up liquid onto their entire society. The process is far from perfect though. It's extremely energy intensive, costly, and complicated to keep environmentally friendly. There are two main techniques. You can boil the water, then catch the steam and condense it while leaving behind the salt, or you can blast the water through filters that catch the salt but let the liquid through. The modern day process resembles the latter, but both tend to use a lot of energy. A UN study from 2018 estimated that the world produces about 25 billion gallons of desalinated water every day, enough to match the use of 25 New York cities. But there's more than salt in seawater. 
there's also often a lot of boron, which isn't good for crops and can even be unhealthy for humans in high enough concentrations. It can be removed, but it requires another level of treatment, which means more cost to make it safe. Even with this taken into consideration, the process of desalinating water has come down greatly in cost over the past few decades, originally costing around $10 per cubic meter of water when it was being developed, it is now sitting between $1 and $2 per cubic meter depending on how it's produced. But there's more to the problem than just the monetary side. When you desalinate seawater, the salt has to go somewhere. Usually it comes out as a byproduct known as brine, a hyper-concentrated salty fluid. Many places that use desalination just pump it right back into the ocean. But that can be a problem. If it is pumped back out to sea, it tends to sink right to the bottom of the ocean floor, suffocating the marine life around it. Marine biologists refer to this sometimes as the blanket of death, because it settles on the floor and kills everything. Even saltwater marine life have their limits in terms of how much salt their bodies can actually process. Right now, the best we can do with a brine is spread it out over a further distance to mitigate most of the damage. One final major issue with desalination is energy consumption, which is a bit of a problem for California since around 14% of the state's power comes from water using hydroelectric dams. On California's Energy Commission website where I pulled this data, they stated that the hydroelectric generation is around 44% lower than 2019's levels because of the dry conditions in the state. And that was just talking about 2020. We're in 2022 now and they are still persistently dealing with these drier seasons and lower water levels. California is taking steps to combat this, raising renewable energy generation in its state to about half and pledging to get renewable energy up to 60% in the future. But even renewable energy can be expensive to put into place and maintain. It seems to be a common theme with using technologies that are newer where they are expensive and haven't reached an efficiency to match other means. But California's options are becoming fewer and fewer. One way or the other, they will soon have to make some tough decisions. Continue putting limits on how much water people are allowed to use, asking farmers not to plant or water parts of their fields, or taking a chance on newer technologies. So will California start using desalination? Well, they already are, with one plant near San Diego delivering 50 million gallons a day to the nearby city, and 12 total in the state. It may seem like California is starting to turn to the ocean for water, but that's not really the case. Just last month, officials voted unanimously against a $1.4 billion proposal to open a desalination plant in Huntington Beach, California on the grounds that the risk to marine life and the higher costs that would be passed on to the consumers would be a deal breaker, with one saying, we are not against desal, we are for the coast, and we are for environmental justice, and we are for coastal resilience in the face of sea level rise. If not desalination, then what? Well, the prevailing argument for now is that recycling water instead of just treating it and sending it out to sea can save more water for a cheaper cost while still being beneficial to the environment. But that's a topic for another video. As the technology currently stands, it is more of a last ditch effort when no other options remain than a go-to source for water. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you liked this episode, be sure to like and subscribe for more. And as always, see you in the next one.